Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. See, uh, see all these bright and shining faces, and it makes the makes the day even better. It's always a joy to come together and, and assemble one with another because we have a common hope, a common faith, a common purpose and mind and heart to be here to worship our only true and living God. And it's a joy to be in the house of the Lord. You know, my lesson this morning is entitled Hope. Hope that sustains us. Hope is defined as a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Well, we see that all around us every day, don't we? We see people hoping for things in the world. The hope that worldly people place in that their trust in is a misplaced and non-sustaining hope. You can find that talked about in Ephesians chapter 2 and 12 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13. It's a hope of desperation is what it boils down to. Because the world has no control. James tells us about that. He talks about when we say we're going to do this or that tomorrow and he says, what is your life but a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away? You ought to be saying if God willed, we could do this or that. Because we have no control over the future. And the world thinks that it can. The world thinks that it can control things, or at least it hopes that it can. One thing that will bring the hope that the world has, it will bring condemnation <coughs> to their souls. And they don't think about that. You can find that mentioned in Mark 16, 16 and uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says that the hope that we have, there is no condemnation. But the hope that the world has, that they choose not to believe in the Lord, but to rely on their own wit, their own abilities, things like that, then, you know, they are going to be condemned. In this life that we live, there are many challenges that we face, and we will face them each and every day. That we will face, that will batter us like a raging storm. We often have poems like that, that talk about the storm raging, and the tossing the to and fro, and and things that happen on the sea. The sea is often used as an example of an overwhelming force and power that we have difficulty controlling. The world sees these storms that battle us each and every day. Often they see them as karma. You've heard of that, karma, it'll come back around to you. Life struggles, it's just a struggle, it's a daily routine, the things that we have to go through, it's just a daily thing that I have to face. Regardless, it's just part of life. Some days it's just bad luck. Some think of it that way. It's just bad luck. <clears throat> they don't think of it the way that they ought to be thinking about it. We who are Christians, however, know why these storms are out there. We know why these struggles are faced. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, it talks about the trial of our faith. It is to protect us, not to harm us. It is to make us stronger, not bring us down. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, if you'll turn with me there a moment. Romans 8, 28, and you've heard this verse, you should know it by now. You see, as Christians, we know in the end, regardless of what struggles we face, in the end, we know everything will work out. It will find a way of taking care of itself. God takes care of us. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. It doesn't make any difference what that storm is. See, the world thinks that all oh, this karma or it's bad luck or... They, they want to hedge on some situation and hope that the weather allows them to do that. And oh, if it doesn't work out, well, it's, it's just bad luck or somebody's out to get me. They're blaming someone or something. If it doesn't work out the way they want. But we know 
regardless of what situations we face, it's going to turn out ultimately for our good. God will see to it that it does. We know that they will strengthen us, these battles that we face each and every day, and make us able to bear the storms that will come in the future. See, we're promised to have storms. We're promised to have struggles. We're going to face them. Peter talks about that. Then, we, of course, we can read in Ecclesiastes about the things that are vain, vanity of all vanities, all life is vain, this, that, and the other. We read about the man that had great possessions and he was concerned, who's going to get my possessions, if you recall? We talked about that. Always worry, always fussing, always wondering what's going to happen. We don't, we don't worry about those things. We know that nothing, are you listening? We know nothing can separate us from the love of God. It makes no difference what it is. Nothing will separate us. Turn to Romans chapter 8. This is how our hope can sustain us. Romans chapter 8, start with verse 35. We know that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And he says, Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, those, those struggles we're talking about, or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword, being at war. See, he's going through and naming all these things. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, he says, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. <coughs> For I am persuaded. Are you listening? Listen to Paul. I am persuaded. He was confident in what he was about to tell us. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Are you listening? Nothing physical whatsoever, nothing spiritual whatsoever, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we've already read in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that all things shall come to good for them that love the Lord. God is watching over us. God is caring for us. His eyes are over the righteous. He loves us. He's listening for our call. He's listening for us to pray to Him. He's watching over us. He's there with us. He dwells within us. He's always confidently there. We know this. Paul's saying nothing's going to take that away from you. Nothing will separate you. Talk about hope. Talk about confidence. Trust, what a wonderful God we have. Notice what else he says in verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Beloved, what a wonderful statement. He covered every possible advantage or angle the devil might think he's got. And said it's not going to happen. God never leaves us. Never forsakes us. No matter what we might face. In this life that we have to live. Our hope sustains us and provides us the reason. To continue the most difficult of tasks in life. Sometimes the battles are hard. Sometimes we encounter situations that bring us down, bring us to our knees. Well, that's where we need to be. We need to be in prayer. We need to be thanking God for His presence, thanking God for the blessings that we have. Paul wasn't worried in any way. He said, whatever circumstance I find myself in, I am there with content. Why? Because I, he knew that God was with him, and it would all work out. See, that's what worries the world. The world. One of the things that the world worries about is how is this going to turn out? How is this going to affect the future? How is this going to affect me? Oh, woe is me. What am I going to do? Paul wasn't worried. And we today have no need to worry. Listen to James. Look at James chapter 1, verse 2. 
Listen to what James has to say. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Why would I? Beloved, when it going gets tough, you've heard the phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Well, beloved, when it gets tough, when it gets hard, when we're in battle and we're in struggle, God's there. God, we're going to start seeing God working in our lives. Count it all joy. You will see the Lord working in your life. You know it's going to turn out for good. You know it's going to strengthen your faith and trust in Him when you see what He does for you. Count it all joy. It's not a sad situation to be in a struggle of any kind. Listen to what he says. Knowing this. Knowing what? Knowing that while I'm in this struggle, while I'm in this situation I find myself in, that I am being tried, I'm being perfected. He says that the trying of your faith what worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see, as we go through these struggles, patience is necessary. Sometimes it takes a little while for things to work out. Sometimes we get to, in a battle and it's hard. It's tough. But you also need to think for a moment and realize that during this time when this was written, a lot of the struggles were very, very real, meaning they were physical things that these people had to face on a daily basis. Things we never have to face. War was a real war when they had war in this time. The swords, the battles that they went through, the struggles, the fighting hand to hand. War was real. Death was real and imminent. Oppression was real and every day we'd find Roman soldiers in the streets oppressing people. It was a real circumstance. It was not what we face on a daily basis. So beloved, when we're facing problems, they're nothing compared to what the people in the first century faced. And yet we find here that all things will work for good. Be counted all joy when you're in trouble. They faced it. They endured it. So can we. There's no single adversary or adversity or challenge that we might face, beloved, that we cannot conquer. Hope and faith go hand in hand together. They actually make us stronger when we face them. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. We've already read Romans 8, 37. We're more than conquerors, that says. We've already overcome and we're going to go beyond it. We're not going to be just victors. We're going to be victorious. Look what 1 Peter 1, 7 says. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory in the appearing of Jesus. When we endure and we prevail, which God will make certain we do, we've already talked about that before, haven't we? God's there. God's listening. God's going to give you an opportunity to win. He's going to help you fight the battle. In many battles, He'll fight for you if you let Him. He wants you to win. He wants you to prevail. He wants you to be with Him in heaven. And He's made every means possible for you to do that to the point that He will not allow you to be tempted above what you can withstand. That's emotional as well as physical. So when we encounter a situation or a circumstance and we think, oh, woe is me. Oh, well, not really. You might not like it. You might be tough, but God knows you can endure it or He wouldn't have allowed you to be in that position. So back to James, count it all joy. You have an opportunity to say, God, I love you. God, I believe in you. Please help me endure this. Help me to show you by being victorious in this situation how much I love you. Remember Joseph? When he was in the position, they would count, he would count his life. Potiphar was being nice when he put him in prison. He said what? He said, how can I do this and sin against my God? 
He had his thoughts straight, didn't he? We need to keep our head on our shoulders and think and realize we're going to win because God's on our side. As Christians, we know and understand that our hope that we place in God is not in vain. There's not an empty cause here. The world hopes and hopes, and often its hope is dashed. It comes to nothing. It means nothing. They were hoping for what? Hoping for a good outcome. Well, it didn't. So, oh no, who can I blame for this problem? Who can I say caused this problem? Oh, it's the weather. Oh, it's the stock market. Oh, they must have bribed the, the refs or something. The world looks to blame. We, our hope, our faith is not in vain. And it will return to us. Our hope and our faith grow stronger with each passing day. Look in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 21. Lamentations 3 and 21. And listen to what he's saying. He says, this I recall to my mind. He's, he's meditating. He's thinking. He's reasoning. He's looking back over his life and over where he is and what's going on. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. He's remembering the promises of God. He's remembering that God is with him. He's remembering the past battles that have gone through and how he has been victorious in those circumstances. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. His love doesn't fail. We, we are where we are today because God loves us. Beloved, we're here in the Lord's church today because God loves us. We're overcoming temptations and trials because God loves us. He makes a way for us. We have eternal life and a hope of life in heaven with God because God loves us. His compassions don't fail. His word will not fail. Look at verse 23. They are what? renewed every morning they are eternal they do not stop great is his faithfulness great is our God we have no reason to whine and complain the struggles we face are real but they're not devastating because in the end we're going to be victorious we're going to win God will see to that God cannot lie. And He's told us we can be victorious. He's told us we can overcome. He watches over the righteous. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. He watches over us He's, because He cares. He's there. His ears are listening for our prayers. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 tells us that God cannot lie. It's impossible, it says. Why? Because it's completely alien and foreign to Him. He, God is righteous. God is love. God is perfect. God is God. Therefore, He cannot be tempted and He cannot lie. It's completely against His nature to do so. He can't do it. He just can't. So knowing this and understanding this, we can place our faith and our hope in Him and realize it will happen. It will come to fruition. God will see to it that I make it through whatever struggle I find myself in. See, our hope ultimately is in Christ. That's where it's founded. It is in Christ. As Christians, we have hope that the world cannot have because it does not understand that hope is in Christ. Look in 1 Timothy 1 verse 1. Our hope is in Christ Jesus himself. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. See, we're, our hope is in Christ. He came. He lived. He dwelt among us. He was born just as we are. He lived as a man just as we live as men. He was tempted and tried in all points even as we are. He suffered pain. He suffered hunger. He cried. He, he cared. 
He had emotions just like we do. In every respect, he was a man. And he gave himself willfully to die in our stead. Because he knew, he knew God would raise him from the dead. Beloved, we can have that same faith, that same hope, <clears throat> that same love. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no shadow of turning. So is Christ. So is His covenant. The Hebrews tells us His covenant is an eternal covenant. It will not change. It will not go away. So when He tells us, I love you, and I will forgive your sins if you will be faithful to me and obey the gospel, I can believe in that. So can you. When He says, I will return one day, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and Thessalonians it tells us that, and we will rise to meet Him in the air. And there we shall ever be with the Lord, and he will bring, we will be with Him in glory. I can believe that, and so can you. So the world wants you to get you down. The world wants you to look at things that you cannot control. Beloved, we can control things because we can control the outcome of those circumstances. The outcome is, Romans chapter 8, everything shall come to good for them to love the Lord. Ultimately, the final outcome is, I want to be with God in heaven, and so do you. We can control that outcome. And that's what God wants us to understand. That's why our hope is based in Christ Jesus. We have this hope because He was resurrected from the grave. Witnessed by so many. Written about in history. Recorded in secular history as well as the Bible. That He was seen. That He was known. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says, But now is Christ risen from the dead... And become the first fruits of them that slept. First Peter chapter one verse three says, "Blessed in be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead." A lively hope. It's living. It's alive. It's it's here. It's now. It's an ongoing hope that we have. Because Christ was raised from the dead, we know we will be. And if we will be raised from the dead as He has promised, so will our sins be forgiven just as He promised. We know that we too will be resurrected just as Christ was. Brethren, let us place our continued trust in the hope of that sustains. This is a sustaining hope. It gets us from day to day. Isn't that what God asks us to do? Each and every day. When you read the Scriptures, He talks about the future. He talks about the outcome and remaining faithful all of our lives. And as we read and we study, we'll find that each and every day is within itself enough. We go from day to day. We are not promised tomorrow. We cannot go backwards to yesterday. We have just today. And certainly, the faith that we have and the hope we have, it's certainly enough to sustain us for today. And when we wake to tomorrow, it can sustain us then as well. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, talks about the promises of our Lord and Savior. He has promised us that He will love us. He's promised to care for us. And God, our Heavenly Father, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 16, 18, 7 through 1. All those are there. Talking about our hope that is firmly based in Christ, in the Lord. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 24, it says, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. He is the one who has given me life. He's the one that sustains my life. He's the one who's promised to give me life eternal. Therefore, I will hope in Him. A hope that cannot fade away. A promise that will be fulfilled. In verse 26 of Lamentations 3, it says, It is good. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait patience for the salvation of the Lord. This is the hope that we have. This is our hope and our strength, our confidence, our assurance. All these things that we have and they're all based in Christ. All founded in God's Word. A God who loves us, who cannot lie. 
This is why we have a hope that the world would like to have, but it can't have as long as they remain in the world. But for those of us who are in Christ, we have that hope, and it cannot be taken away. It will not fade away. It will only go stronger with each passing day. If you're here this morning and you need to put your Lord on in baptism and have that hope that cannot fade away, a hope that sustains you from day to day, a hope that can put a smile on your face as you pray and thank God for all the wonderful things that you have here and now and will have someday, you can do that. If you're here this morning and you need the prayers of the church, you need to have that hope or you want your hope renewed to be strengthened. We're here for you. Whatever need in Christ you have, we love you. God most certainly does. Let us strengthen your hope. Let us encourage your hope and faith. Let us do for you whatever we can. Won't you come? While together we stand and invite you in song.